Welcome to the Homesteaders of America podcast, where we encourage simple living, hard work, natural health care, real food, and building an agrarian society. If you're pioneering your way through modern noise and conveniences, and you're an advocate for living a more sustainable and quiet life, this podcast is for you. Welcome to this week's podcast. I'm your host, Amy Fuel, and I'm the founder of the Homesteaders of America organization and annual events. If you're not familiar with us, we are a resource for homesteading education and online support, and we even host a couple of in-person events each year, with our biggest annual event happening right outside the nation's capital here in Virginia every October. Check us out online at homesteadersofamerica.com. Follow us on all of our social media platforms and subscribe to our newsletter so that you can be the first to know about all things HOA. That's short for Homesteaders of America. Don't forget that we have an online membership that gives you access to thousands, yes, literally thousands of hours worth of information and videos. It also gets you discount codes, an HOA decal sticker when you sign up, and access to event tickets before anyone else. All right, let's dive into this week's episode. Welcome back to the Homesteaders of America podcast. This week we have Tom from McMurray Hatchery joining us. Tom, why don't you introduce yourself and a little bit about your business so we can get started? Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, I'm a homesteader, I guess, myself, me and my family. We live on five acres and we have cows and pigs and chickens and we're always adding to that and... uh, you know, gardening and living the best we can. So I'm the president of Murray McMurray Hatchery. So we're a family-owned chicken hatchery that's 105 years old. Wow. So we've been uh, hatching chickens for quite some time now. Um, <laughs> yeah. So you have some experience in this, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little yep. bit. Um, so yeah, it's me and my father-in-law. We're partners here with Mer- Murray McMurray Hatchery. And, you know, there's quite the history in 105 years, but it kind of boils down to I really like chickens and kept it going. So it's passed down through the, through the generations here. So that's uh, the brief version of it, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you guys are also sponsors of the 2023 Homesteaders of America event. So you guys have been sponsors for the last couple of years. And so we thank you for that. And then also for those of you watching on YouTube, I have this super cool, McMurray Hatchery mug. Isn't it lovely? Um, So you can go check them out online. (laughs) Um, You guys, why don't you tell us a little bit about your website? Because a lot of people think you're just a hatchery, but you guys do way more than that. Oh, yeah. So while we have here is we hatch all of the chickens. So we have our farms. We have five farms within an hour here of Webster City. We have all of our breeder flocks. We have about 45,000 laying hens. So just a couple. Yeah, just a few. (laughs) But So on our website, we do sell everything chicken related so we always kind of so the one-stop coop shop so whether you need feeders or waters heat bulbs uh heat plates you know if you're brooding your chicks all the way up to you know laying stuff you need nesting boxes you need egg cartons you need uh you need help selling them we can help you with that too so yeah you guys kind of it's have a, everything it's a little bit of everything yeah it's awesome yeah. that's really neat and um i wanted to just highlight that because a lot of people don't know that there's other options out there you know when you're buying your chicks you can just kind of hop right into the mcmurray store and you can buy everything you need for those chicks and yeah, chickens absolutely. and they even have this super cool is it a 75 pound feeder is that what it is that you can like buy for your chickens. Of course I did that. And my geese ate all the feed in like two days. (laughs) (laughs) Don't recommend it if you have geese, but, um, yeah, so you guys have a lot of cool stuff going on. So today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about chickens. Obviously springtime is, is here pretty much at the posting of this podcast. And so people are starting to think about chicks and, how to get started with chickens yeah, and what they should do. So I'm going to ask just a couple of questions that you probably get all the time. And then we're going to dive into a little bit more discussion after that. So mm-hmm. for you as a hatchery owner, what would you say that if somebody is just getting started with chickens, what are yeah. some of the best breeds, maybe like three, what are the top three breeds you think they should get started with? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's probably question number one, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, well, I don't know what to get. So Anything we say like a, a brown egg layer is kind of the – they're kind of a baseline. I, I, that's not the right terminology, but uh, they're they're typically larger, bigger hens. So they're the most hardy breeds um, typically. 
So they're they're kind of great for people getting into it. So they're a little more forgiving, you know, of, of, of things. They're they're great for almost any climates. That's another question. It's like, all right, so you know, whether you're in Alaska or in Florida, you know, a, a barred rock is gonna gonna work. You know, they they're just really good adapted to, you know, all of the climates that we have across all of America. So they just fit in really well. So barred rocks, Plymouth rocks. So it's barred Plymouth rock. Barred is a color pattern. But the Plymouth Rocks are really good. Americanas, so people really like the blue. They're a blue egg laying bird. Um, they're very good again for almost every climate. They're they're hardy. They're good against predators. You know, they're just aware. Buff Orpingtons, so they're a pretty classic bird and they're pretty. So they're also they're great starts. So and they're they're friendly. They're friendly for you know people with kids or other animals. You know, they don't seem to cause a whole lot of problems. So no. they're just easy to keep. Yeah. So we, um, the first year we got chickens, we got barred rocks and they were like little pets. Like if you guys, <laughs> they will follow you around like dogs if you spend any amount of time with them. And so we brought home some chicks from conference last year from McMurray Hatchery. And one of them just happened to be a barred rock. And so <laughs> this little chicken, she thinks that she is not a chicken. She thinks, well, for the longest time, she thought she was a turkey because she <laughs> she lived with the turkeys when we had them. And so she would always follow the turkeys everywhere. Uh, well, then we butchered the turkeys. And then she was like, wait, I don't have a family anymore. And so now she's decided she's a cow because now she's, yeah. she's best friends with our cow. And I'm like, this chicken, there's something wrong with this chicken. But it's really funny to to watch. I've been trying to get a picture of them, but she always hops That's off fun. when the cow's laying down. She'll hop on top of her and sit there, but she'll oh, never yeah. let me get a picture. So yeah, I, we love Bard Rocks and Orpingtons and, and all those breeds, those yeah. simple breeds. Now, I do want to talk about a breed that I'm really, really loving from you guys, which are the Whiting True Blues and the Whiting True Greens. Would you oh, talk yeah. a little bit about those and what they are? Yeah. So um, the Whitings are a specific line of McMurray Hatchery. We worked with a geneticist out of Colorado, a Dr. Tom Whiting. So the Whiting Farms are fly ties. So anybody who fly fishes would probably recognize Whiting Farms. So he raises chickens specifically for their feathers. So he's, he's all of the breeding and stuff he's done for generations, you know, of it is for fly tying feathers, but he's always been a fan of McMurray Hatchery as well. So he, uh, he reached out and said, I've got these really good blue and green egg layers. And so we, uh, we'd gotten some stock from him and now we, we do perpetuate that line here ourselves but uh they're just kind of fun colored but they're specifically bred for their egg color so we do a really hard selection on on egg size and egg uniformity and then that color so the whiting blues lay blue eggs and the whiting greens lay a, a green egg so yeah. So a lot of people, they'll ask about hatcheries to get chickens from. And then, so recently we hatched a, a batch of our own chicks and I'll, I'll never fail. I'll get somebody to say, but I thought you got your chicks from McMurray. And I'm like, I do get my chicks from McMurray, but your whiting shit, your whiting stock has become one of my favorite genetics to work with here for the last couple of years, because they produce, you know, with my, with my regular flock and just integrated in with your whitings, mm -hmm. um, that we got from you, they create the most resilient chicken I have ever had. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's crazy. Like they're super self-reliant. They are consistent egg layers. They're, they remind me a little bit of the Icelandics that we used to have. We had oh, chickens sure. yeah. several years ago and they were a little bit too wild for me. But these whiting hybrids that we we have going on with our flock, like and just hatching them over and over again, they seem to be really incredibly self reliant. Not as crazy as the Icelandics, but also super um, <laughs> self sufficient. And so, I had posted about them on Instagram not long ago, and people were like, "What? I've never heard of these before." So, I did want to touch on that really quickly. That you guys. You know, a lot of people want to add new stock to their, their chicken flock, but maybe you don't want to buy them every year. So it's something to think about, oh, I could buy from McMurray certain genetics and, you know, and yeah. have these chicks and then further my own flock. And then a few years later, add more from McMurray. And um, so there's a lot of different things that I'm seeing homesteaders do, including myself. That's not just buying chicks every year, but Absolutely. I really enjoy that you guys take 
take care in your genetics and what you select to send to people, because I feel like that's really important too. So moving past those types of things, what would you say is probably your most exotic breed of chicken that you guys offer at the hatchery? Yeah, boy, Ginger, she, she gets, she gets kind of mad at me because we put something in the catalog and then it never fails that like the next year, it just doesn't do very well. Mm -hmm. And so then it's just like really limited on what we have for hens. We've got a lot. So out of the, we work real closely with the livestock conservancy and, um, we're trying to, you know, that's my, my goal is, uh, is to perpetuate conservationism mm -hmm. and keeping the, you know, the heritage genetics alive and, and not just, like I said, for, not for our use, but for everybody. Like, right. so the goal is to have homeowners, you know, raising their own birds, but to do it in a specific manner, you're creating a land race that's perfect for what your, your needs are. But also we value keeping the kind of those genetic lines available to, to be able to do that. So we've got, 40 out of the 70 on their, uh, the livestock conservancy's list of rare and exotic, you know, they're wow. not threatened in a conservation status. So we've got quite a few of the lines that are, are, are very rare. Our, our red cap line only exists one, one other place in North America. And so there's one farm in Texas and then there's our farm and that's all over the red caps in North America. Wow. But, you know, that that's probably under 30 hens yeah, total that's... like on both farms so it's yeah wow um, there that's are crazy. there's a pretty good sized flock in england and then there's a good flock in australia as well that's that's where you'd have to go to find them again mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> but then breeds kind of we consider them rare and exotic for a reason they either have poor hatchability um you know they don't have a strong native sense of survival <laughs> yeah and you know our uh, sultans our sumatras they're they're extremely rare um and they're hard to raise so we talk about a first time homesteader home buyer backyard chicken keeper probably wouldn't want to start out with those they're uh, that's expert level chicken keeping <laughs> just you know I, there's a lot of things about sheep the goal of the sheep is to try to die or to kill right. itself and it's like some of it's like i don't know if they're not sheep <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, and those, uh, those chickens you just mentioned, are those the ones with those really long tail feathers? Like the roosters have those long tail feathers or those different, um, the Sumatras kind of have a little bit longer tail than, than I would consider normal mm -hmm. that, uh, a Phoenix is one that does have the, uh, Oh, that's probably what I was thinking yeah. of. Yeah. Sumatras are domesticated cool. crows. Like they're, they're, they're all black. Mm -hmm. They're, they're shiny, they're shimmery and they're just completely wild. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so all of those genetics, awesome. But what does Tom have on his farm? So what do you like oh, to yeah. raise on your homestead? I go back and forth because, you know, I do stuff that I like to I'm, – I'm a dabbler, so I, I'm, I'm working on things. Mm -hmm. I've got uh, some dorkings at home right now that I like working with. The silver gray dorkings are – they're just mm – -hmm. they're just really cool birds. They're kind of – they're heavy, they're short, they have five toes, but they're just, they're very docile, almost to a fault. Like they need to be a yeah. little bit more active. They need to run away from the fox, yeah. not towards it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've got, I've got quite a few of those at home. I've got some chocolate Orpingtons that I'm trying to raise up. I, it's always the project stuff at the, yeah at the hatchery kind of needs. It's like, oh, I'll take that home and I'll work on that. You know, we've got Right now we have that could be 200, dangerous. <laughs> 200 chickens in our basement. And my wife is uh, less than happy. So. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, goodness. I bet your wife loves that. <laughs> it's uh, We were gone for the weekend and then we came back and, and the house just smells like a barn. And she's oh, like, yeah. mm, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've no, got I days, feel that. We, so. Uh, so last year when we first moved here, we got a bunch of meat chicks from you guys. Mm -hmm. And of course, meat chicks poop three times more than regular oh, sure. chicks. Yeah. And uh, our garage is in our basement and our bedroom is right over top of our garage. And at that time, we had them in our garage and we woke up one morning and we were like, oh, what is that smell <laughs> in our bedroom? And it was it because it, you know, everything rises. It We had oh, just yeah. changed them, but just in that day and a half time period, they, they were funking up the place. So 
So speaking of meat chicks, you guys do more than just egg layers. Yeah. And at the October conference last year, you talked about uh, meat chickens and and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So now's the time to really – people are really starting to get into putting their orders in and things. So right now, we're recording this at the beginning of February. What what does your time frame look like if people want to hop in on the, the meat chicken – train this year should they get in really really soon or how does that work yeah. with with how many people are raising meat chickens this year so what we kind of ran into the last few years is a uh, is i don't want to say shortages but definitely a supply chain issues and we're not seeing that so far this year but the demand is is very very high mm-hmm. so i am getting what we're asking for in eggs but we're still probably not keeping up with what what we need so yeah, if you need to order, I would not wait. Um, yeah. So don't don't put it off. You can order. And so what's what's nice about McMurray Hatchery is you could call today, and you can put an order in for the end of October. There's no reason to not do it as soon as you can. You go. Oh, we'll do that later. We'll do that later. No, call and from the beginning of November of last year, you could be placing orders for any time in this year. And the sooner you get it in, the sooner that you get the dates that you're looking for. Yeah, that's what we did. I knew that it was going to be crazy. So I remember, you know, when 2020 hit, you guys, I'm sure had, it was crazy for you, if I remember correctly. (laughs) Um, And so we, we definitely knew from that year, like we need to start getting our order in soon because there's no telling what could happen. You know, again, look how Mm -hmm. quickly that, that declined in the country. And so so speaking of that, what are you seeing? What are you seeing in the homesteading community as far as people ordering chickens? Has anything changed? Like obviously the amount is more, but how much more do you think it is? And then are you seeing a difference in people and what they're ordering? Are they ordering is it less backyard chicken people and more homestead type people? Or talk about that a little bit. You know, because of what we we carry, so all of those, you know, we have 110 varieties of chickens. We have 20 varieties of duck, 12 turkeys or 12 geese, pheasants, quail, all of that stuff that we really cater to a a large group of people. Um, Mm -hmm. And and we still probably do more backyard than, than homesteaders, but homesteaders is absolutely growing. And so when you see that, you're seeing multiple orders. You know, typically you'll say we'll do some meat birds and some layers, and you might do layers every other year or every third year, but you'll you'll see successive broiler, and so that's that's nice. But then in the backyard flocks, like I said, they're smaller orders. You you might top out at twenty birds and within that those kind of situations, but uh, we do a, a lot of those. I mean, statistically, it's mm-hmm. the bulk of them. It's going to be – it's a busy year. Like you said, 2020 was one of the best, uh, busiest years we've ever had. And it just happens to be that with chicken keeping, you do you do that two-year window because they lay really good the first year right. and they lay pretty good the second year. And that third year, they're like, oh, they're not laying that great. Like, mm-hmm. And so like that's the – in our business, we see a kind of a roller coaster. So it's like every other year, it's like, well, we're getting – the people who ordered two years ago are going to reorder again. Yeah. So we're hitting that that kind of that peak of this wave right now from the 2020 people who got into chickens. So it's a lot of existing customers, but it's a lot more birds than we're ready for. Yeah. So it's, That's incredible. Um, it's very, very busy. So Ginger asked me, and this is probably a good place to put this. She was talking to me yesterday. So for you guys who don't know Ginger, a lot of you will know Ginger because she's with Tom at our events Um, And so you can stop by their booth and say hello. But for those of you who don't, Ginger helps with marketing, helps with the McMurray business. But Ginger had had asked me yesterday, she said that there was just a rumor going around again about the government passing a law to ban shipping chickens across states or out of states. Do you have Mm -hmm. any information on that? I know people will question that since you're on here. Yeah, so she she sent that to me in in a in kind of a tizzy, and I said I'm I'm aware. They actually the vet on supporting this veil had reached out to us last year. Probably he reached out, and we talked several times on the phone, and he wanted our support on this bill. And um, Mm -hmm. what it is is a bill to curb shipping of adult roosters for specifically cockfighting. Gotcha. And I, I I wouldn't put our name on it. Obviously, we're against cockfighting. It's right. it's illegal. Don't do it. I don't. But I don't even. 
I couldn't tell you anything about it. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's so far out of our, our realm. And I think where our customer base is that it's, I'm not concerned about it because I don't think it'll make it out of a committee level. Yeah. I don't like seeing restrictions on shipping on, on, on birds kind of at any level. Right. Right. <laughs> Especially for something that's already illegal. Like if you have scenarios yeah. where you, you know, something's going on, then do something about it. But like, right. You know, putting, just making it, harder for people to do honest business like mm-hmm. isn't really i don't think the cockfighting is actually like this huge thing through the mail i don't think so either i mean we we around here i'm sure it happens but when whenever i've seen like sometimes you'll in the south you'll drive by these houses that have you know roosters on leashes and there's like 20 yeah. of them right yep um it's kind of obvious what they're doing, (laughs) you know, but you, then you can go on Facebook or you can go on Craigslist and buy chicken, you know, roosters for like a buck, you know? So it's not, yeah, I think you're right. I don't think it's, I don't think the roosters are probably a big deal through the mail as much as people might think. No. And to ship anything through the mail and especially across state lines, you have to be NPISB certified. So that's the national poultry improvement plan. So Mm -hmm. you have to have an inspection from your facility from a vet at some point, you know, whether that's annually, you have to follow testing protocols. So if you're running a, a underground illegal cockfighting, right. it's not, it's gotta be fairly obvious to right. whoever has to go right. through there. Like, so I don't know, like there's already steps. I'm not particularly concerned about this particular yeah. piece of legislation. So now there was an issue. I, You'll have you'll know this more than I will, but I do remember there was an issue. Was it in 2020 where you guys were having a hard time shipping chicks through the United States Postal Service? Was it for a lack of? Was it during the shutdowns or what? What was that all about? So, yeah. So actually, that was and it's oh, it's that's the biggest concern in my in entire existence. That's what keeps me up at night. Is we rely mm-hmm. on the post office. There are no other options. Well, they do a very good job. Typically, they don't handle disruptions very well and when you're hatching chickens like there are no other options they're gonna hatch (laughs) they're coming out so if you tell me like well in three hours we're not gonna we're gonna close down it's like well i'm you know i don't have i I have you know a thousand chicks i gotta get rid of (laughs) well in in our in our we might have a hundred thousand wow oh my goodness and, you know, we're a small hatchery compared to some of them, and we're all kind of in that same boat that, you know, we just can't hold that many birds. And they actually, the 2020, yeah. they shut us down for two weeks um, with zero notice. Mm-hmm. So that's crazy. Real tough. It's tough to recoup because we do, our season is 24 weeks. So if you take two of those out, then you're, that's a significant part of our. Our ability yeah. to do business. So, what were what did you do with all those chicks? Um, so, the first week we were able to do ground shipments. So, you could not fly with the birds; you could go ground. So, we ended up driving a, a, across the whole Midwest. We drove to Montana. Wow. We drove um, to Michigan. We drove to Texas. We drove to St. Louis. Everywhere that we could drop off birds and hit a kind of a metropolitan area, we did. Mm-hmm. So that's dedication, Tom. Uh, we, yeah. <laughs> We did what we could do. And then on on one particular day, we did just have a sale out the back door. And it was like a a dollar a bird, you know, all sexed females come get what you can can have. And we tried to put some away for our flocks. Um, Mm -hmm. But again, it's if it's now we've got an inch of snow coming down today. It's not really the time to be brooding. No, yeah, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, you guys have snow and we have rain today, but it's like springtime outside, which is, you know, we've got some chicks outside today and it's warm enough, but I'm just waiting for the weather to say, hey, winter, winter really is here and you're going to regret putting those chicks outside. And you keep saying that word spring and it's like, where, where? (laughs) I know. (laughs) I always forget we're on the East Coast, you know, we're in the middle of the East Coast. And so, but you guys are way up North. And so you guys are quite a bit colder than we are. Wow. Yeah, we're not, we're not, I've not seen spring yet. Yeah. So, well, you'll have to come to Virginia. We've had a couple of nice days and it, we're coming. We're, you know, we got a couple of weeks here yet, but then we'll be, we'll be feeling like spring. Yeah. Too. Well, you know, some of our biggest blizzards are in March. So I, I'm still holding on that we're going to get tricked one way or the other soon. So, yeah. 
Yeah, we're the same. We get the most snow in March, but we're usually not cold. Yeah. So. Okay. Sometimes well, it's too cold to snow. So speaking of all of the, you know, we'll move away from the United States Postal <laughs> Service drama because, you know, I'm sure we could spend more time on that. But so you guys have more than just chicks. You kind of touched on that for a second. You have turkeys and geese and other birds. Uh, you also have ducks. We've gotten quite a few ducks from you guys, too. What would you say for a first time homesteader getting started? Would you say there's any other other than like chicken chicks? Is there any kind of bird they should stay away mm -hmm. from the first year? Are they all kind of easy to take care of, or how does that work? So yeah, no, it gets it can get really complicated. Um, I think turkeys are the most yeah. similar to chickens as far as what you can do in raising them and even keeping them together. It's not recommended, but I I do it and that's. I have great success. Mm -hmm. Ducks and geese are kind of a, a different ball game. They're they're really fun. They've got huge personalities. It goes back to what your goal is as a homesteader. What are right. you are you trying to produce just food for yourself? Are you trying to produce food to sell or to um, barter or, or or use outside of your own own use? I think when you're doing it yourself, there's um. There's more window for, for error. I mean, it's not, it's like, yeah, all right, well, we're going to raise 20 turkeys and we really don't need 15 or, you know, so there's right. a, like ducks and geese have completely different feed requirements than chickens. I mean, optimally you need to be on a much higher protein level that gets really expensive mm -hmm. if you're trying to feed the one feed you know they're they're really messy they need they almost need separate space you can raise them with chickens but they're going to cause uh, issues within your chickens because of how wet they are mm -hmm. and that's like wet moist is like the worst thing for chickens yeah. it's it's a they will be sick all the time they get colds you know and they'll be they'll be all stuffed up constantly mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah um <clears throat> but it's 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 really doable but i think having it kind of laid out before you get into it don't buy the, oh, they were there and they were pretty and they're cute. And it's like, all right, well, I need to have a separate pen. I need to have a separate feed system. You know, they don't, ducks and geese don't have to have water, but they do need deep enough water to wash their right. their eyes and their, their nostrils and stuff out. And so they're on, they're on their own little level and they are fun, but there are requirements. If you're going to sell duck eggs, there's a really, really big market for duck eggs. People don't sell goose eggs because they mm -hmm. just don't lay that many. It's, uh, you know, not for what they eat. You, like I said, they ate yeah. all of your chicken food. They eat a lot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, yeah. So that's the thing I learned. So I, I have found that I can raise two geese with my flock integrated together. And it with the amount of space I've given them, it doesn't get messy. But um, when we were raising ducks, we had six ducks and it was awful. Like it was so awful. It was exactly what you said. It was wet all the time. There was poop everywhere. It was like, and they would tear our yard up when this was when we lived on a half an acre. Um, <laughs> don't do that. Don't do what Amy does. <laughs> um, and so, but they were really fun. Like you said, you know, ducks are just so loving and, um, geese are the same way if you raise them, you know, from a gosling. But yeah, we've kind of, we learned real quick what our limit was and not to like leave out freedom food because our ducks and geese both would just gorge themselves on feed. And I had a bunch of feed out. We had gone on vacation one year and I had a bunch of feed out and I had a duck just, just keep eating the feed. Like she wouldn't stop eating it. And so my poor farm sitter walked out the next morning and found her, you know, she had just toppled over and she was just full of feed. Like she had just eaten all yeah. this feed and it was too much for her. And so there are definitely, you know, don't, don't buy the ducks just cause they're cute. Really think about it. You know, the commitment that you have to make uh, for those animals and just do your research. And you guys have a lot of information on your website too. Cause yeah. right. You guys have that blog post. Uh, the blogs are still going and you have new information yep. on there all the time. Yep. Absolutely. Well, the blogs are a great resource. They're everything you think you needed to know is in there somewhere. Yeah. But yeah, so it comes back to your, you know, what your your homestead farm plan is. Like if it's, you know, you're going to – and budget's a really big part mm -hmm. of that. And so it's a bigger budget to do kind of 
ducks and geese. You know, turkeys are the same, um, but you get a lot of meat off a turkey. You do. You know. <laughs> yeah. So we we got turkeys from you guys for the first time last year, and we we were really impressed with turkeys. And so yeah. it actually came at the best time because my husband found out he's now allergic to beef and pork. And so, oh, yeah. um, he pretty much can't eat anything that's not a chicken <laughs> or a turkey. <laughs> uh, and so he can eat birds. And so that's what we did this year. We, we are one of those people. We, I think we have 40 birds on order with you guys. Um, we're splitting up 20 in the spring and then 20 in the summertime. And, um, you do, I was amazed at how much meat you can get off a turkey in a pretty short amount of time. But we, um, I'm not sure if I've told you this story yet. Um, we got the McMurray, is it the brown ones? What, what's the exact name for those? Yeah. The bronze. The brown, yeah. So we got them and they look just like our wild turkeys. We have a flock of wild turkeys out here that just roam around. And we had one uh, white turkey from you guys that for that batch. And there's an older lady that lives across the field from us. And uh, she called me one day and she's like, have you seen these turkeys? And I said, which turkeys? You know, I didn't know she was talking about the wild ones or mine because mine would just disappear during the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she's like, the the one with the albino turkey. And I'm like, oh, man, those are my turkeys. Oh. <laughs> and uh, she said, I thought they were wild. And I went out on my front porch to shoo them away. And they started running after me, she said. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. And those things are huge, you know. And she's like, yeah, they, they scared me. And I'm so, I'm so sorry, ma'am. Like, I'm, I'm so sorry. But those things will wander, too. And so oh, yeah. that was something I wasn't prepared for, for them to kind of wander a little bit, but I will say they, they were really good at converting bugs and grass into meat. And I'm not a huge Turkey fan, but when this is tastes totally different to me than store-bought Turkey mm -hmm. and we've really enjoyed, we've really enjoyed them. So, yeah, yeah, we, uh, I had kind of a similar one. We raised some turkeys when we were in town and they, got out and so our backyard was uh was field when it had trees along it and they just kind of disappeared and we have crick back there so it's coyotes and fox and raccoons and stuff we just assumed they got eaten and it was like two weeks later someone down across the block called i'm like hey do you have turkeys and it's like well we did you know it's like no they're here in my backyard like no oh, no and so they've been she had a bird feeder out and so they've just been living under the bird feeder and so, oh. you know, you can't catch turkeys. So we were, no. it was like two degrees outside. Me and my wife were parked and we have the minivan, you know, on the street. And we're just running around this house trying to catch this turkeys <laughs> on this old lady's back porch. And it, it's, it, it goes like you think it would. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. They do make us laugh though. When we had all those turkeys, they were such gangly things and they were just big goofballs. And we kept, <laughs> we kept two of them. And I'm sure you guys have maybe seen on my Instagram a few times. I should, I should make another video, but, um, the male Turkey, he always comes to our glass door in the front and he just pecks on the glass until I open the door for him. <laughs> and so, and we don't really spend that much time with him, but he's just so personable. He's, they, they're pretty funny. They, we've enjoyed they them way funny. more than we thought we would. That's for sure. Okay. So going back to homesteaders and, and everything you guys have to offer, uh, the, there are some homestead concerns about getting chicks in the mail. So I see this every spring, you know, what do we do if our chicks arrive and, you know, there's some dead or they're all dead or, or whatnot. How would someone go about dealing with that? And so yeah. I, I always have to navigate that because everybody wants to blame the hatchery first, but um, oftentimes it has to do with the post office. So how would you suggest people go about managing sure. that? Yeah. So I, it's a valid concern, you know. Um, yeah. But it's, you know, as I said, it's a conservationist at heart. Like how do you, you know, wrap my head around putting the chicks in the mail? And, and actually it's mm -hmm. it's really, really successful. We see about a 4% loss. Mm -hmm. So out of all of our shipments, we, we lose about 4%. Okay. But – What's what kind of validates I think what we do and how we do it is is that if we take the birds right directly to the farm, within that first week we we still see about a four percent loss. Oh, um, okay. So you know, yeah, not everything is going to be perfectly viable. We do select you know the healthiest chicks off the bat, mm -hmm. 
but that comes down to incubation and you know uniformity of that that's what we're we're really good at you know if you want to say what's different about us than somebody else it's you know the the manage we put into our flocks and then our incubation practices are to make that that chick as strong as possible yeah so that's the end goal we you know premium feed you know all you can eat buffet like space light cuz i want a strong healthy chick because yeah we're going to we're going to put it in the mail so it's very, very similar in percentage to what we would see as a, as a loss on our farm, even okay. without going through the mail. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. It does happen. Handling is, is a, a bigger issue than especially specifically the time. So, you know, we just want them mm-hmm. to do their job. That's it. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my dad, uh, my dad used to drive for the post office. So he would drive a box, one of the box trucks. So he was the um, intermediate between the mail, the post office, and then the little, you know, delivery drivers. And so he would always call me and say, your checks are on the way. <laughs> and, uh, and so he was just amazed that there were so many big box truck drivers that would just throw the chicks in the back and then, you know, just not thinking anything of it. And so he would always tell me, I put the chicks right up front under the heater. So they're going to stay warm. And, <laughs> and so I would always make me chuckle, but we, I mean, I would say that we've had pretty pretty good rate on all of our male chicks. And we even moved uh, last year and we still have had, I mean, I've maybe lost two each batch maybe. Um, And so I would say that, and normally you guys put extra in for that reason. So I would say, you know, I I haven't seen a a huge issue. And, and we, we guarantee delivery and 48 hours after delivery, hundred percent. So we can either reship or refund. And it's, we, it's not, it's a no questions asked. I don't need to see pictures. I believe you like, and we've been burnt on that, but that's part of, part of it. So, yeah. All right. So now people have their chicks and they're loving on their chicks. What are some common illnesses that you see? Uh, that people should start looking for and then how can they kind of combat that or maybe even prevent it before it happens? Yeah, absolutely. Um, The first one that you'll see is is coccidiosis. Mm -hmm. And coccidiosis is a protozoa that they get. It's an intestinal parasite, basically. And you'll see that probably between three and eight weeks old. So kind of either in the brooder or slightly after the brooder. And um, it, it's it's everywhere. It's on everything. It's on this desk right now. It's just part of life. It's part of nature. Mm-hmm. And it isn't an issue until it builds up. And what it coccidiosis does is it really thrives in wet environments. So if you have wet bedding or if they spill water or you're raising ducks with them, then you're going to see an explosion of coccidiosis. Yeah. Um, it's a very, very simple thing to treat. You can go cord or amprol is a, a water additive that you want in and it will kind of clean that out. Um, coccidiosis, it affects dogs, cats, chickens, all all livestock. So your vet, a local vet can do a, a fecal float, take a sample of their poop and they'll float it and they'll tell you what your coccidiosis percentage is. So it's like $7. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a really simple thing. It's a really simple test. It's not just chickens you know it's so but that's probably the first thing and the way to combat that is just to keep everything dry yeah and then they they build up a natural immunity to it so the more they're you know they're around it it's just keeping that when it gets wet and it's wet for a a period of time that's you're going to see an explosion of coccidiosis so some of that's just your brooding practices you know right having them enough space and adding bedding if you need to cleaning up any spilled Mm -hmm. water it's Yeah, I would say the only time that we've ever really seen that is, you know, when I have a child taking care of the chicken, you know, the chicks and they're not quite doing it well enough or changing the bedding up. And I I would say that every time it happened when because the bedding was too wet or it hadn't been changed Mm -hmm. soon enough. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's and it happens and it happens. We, you know, we just kind of plan on it. We know what our our brooding we kind of stock a little bit heavy. You know, it's something we just watch for. Mm-hmm. But outside of that, that's the fastest one that you'll see. Yeah. Everything, almost every other chicken disease is respiratory. Yeah. So it's, they get colds and they get flus and they get sinus junk and it's, chickens have bad respiratory systems. They're, yeah. they're the, they're the sick kid in the class. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, it, it's damp and wet. 
and is is going to influence what they they pick up. And it's just again, there's just things out there that it happens. So you know, keeping a fan in the coop even in the winter is is, is I think is pretty key. It helps keep everything dry. Um, chicks, chickens, and they um, they're very humid. You know, outside of just pooping on the floor, they they expel a lot of moisture mm-hmm. through their their breathing. Um, that's how they cool off. So they're just a very humid animal. So yeah, that, you know, warm, humid environments. Chickens have a higher body temperature than people. It's like 102, 103 degrees, mm-hmm. which is perfect for all bacteria to thrive. Oh yeah, and they live in poop, kind of. <laughs> well, generally, we I think chicks are pretty – normally they're pretty easy to take care of. Yeah, they are. Um, yeah, they are. And, and so most so. people probably won't have an issue. But, well, Tom, I think this has been a good chat to get most people right, started. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to add before we close it out? No, we're just uh, – we're happy to support Homesteaders America. We're excited to come back. I uh, I, I told Ginger a little bit ago, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take an extra day and I'm going to fish. I'm going to fish. Yeah, there. yeah, you should. So I would drive by it every time. I'm like, I don't know why I'm not fishing down there. So <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. All right, Tom. Well, thank you for joining me. And you yeah. guys, make sure if you come to HOA this year that you check out uh, Tom and Ginger at the McMurray Hatchery booth. They're sponsors again this year, and they always have chicks, and they're there to answer all your questions, and they're full mm-hmm. of information. Um, and then also check them out online at mcmurrayhatchery.com and get those chick order in before they are gone. Yeah, do it soon. All right. Thanks so, for joining us, Tom. Thanks, Amy. Hey, thanks for taking the time to listen to this week's Homesteaders of America episode. We really enjoyed having you here. We welcome questions, and you can find the transcript and all the show notes below or on our Homesteaders of America blog post that we have up for this podcast episode. Don't forget to join us online with a membership or just to read blog posts and find out more information about our events at homesteadersofamerica.com. We also have a YouTube channel and follow us on all of our social media accounts to find out more about homesteading during this time in American history. All right, have a great day and happy homesteading.